Okay. Okay, guys. Today we're going to talk about words of wisdom from an awesome filmmaker, Jeremy Saulnier. He made these two movies. And yes, I now own Green Room because it came out on Blu-ray this week. Jeremy Saulnier is the director of Green Room. If you watch this channel, you've been hearing about it constantly. I'm not going to review it. We're going to talk a little bit about the indie filmmaking process because he is one of the more interesting, in my opinion, indie filmmakers going on currently. Sounds like he's about to merge into the studio system a little bit more. Before we do, if you are interested in these movies as well, just know that they're both extremely violent. I like really, really violent movies, and even though we're at a horrible time of violence in this country, this is still escapism for me. It doesn't count. Real violence is terrible. I hate it. Obviously. Hold on. I'll close that door. See if the cicadas get any quieter. A little bit. He had a movie before both of these called Murder Party, which feels very unlike it. It's more like a horror comedy. This is a revenge thriller actually about how pointless violence is, and this one is just about a really bad situation. Really vibrant, vital filmmaking. The way that independent film happens now, there are certain boxes you should check in order to make the process not so crazy on yourself. Like having things take place in very few locations, making it mostly dialogue, making it mostly play out just in these couple rooms. More like TV, because it's easier to shoot, and you can get through more pages in a day, which he really did not do with this. This is actually pretty much in one location, but that wasn't the point he was trying to make. It still costs ten times more than this. Making a film is expensive because you have a bunch of people together that need to be paid, and you have a bunch of equipment that you've rented. Most equipment rental packages happen in blocks of a week. For most indie productions have a six-day week break a day, and then back to another six day week. So we're going to be listening to audio from three podcasts today. Uh, he has been on the Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith twice, once for Blue Ruin, once for Green Room, and he was on Philip DeFranco's podcast, Jeremy Solonier and Anton Yelchin. Ah, oh, God, the Anton Yelchin thing breaks my heart. I can't believe he's gone. He's one of my favorite young actors. Very good interview. So we're going to be pulling from those to listen to today. Jeremy Solonier was working as a DP on other indie films before he made Blue Ruin. All these different movies all had the same schedule. 18 days, three six-day weeks. I needed more days. I, I couldn't shoot movies properly in the very standard three six-day week schedule, which is what I did. The last three films I shot before Blue Ruin had identical schedules, but were very different scripts, so different lengths and different contents. So I could tell there was a very sort of cookie cutter approach to how we do these things. So I wanted to go big. I wanted to like, tear down those walls we were always confined in and get on the open road and have blood and guts and all kinds of fun stuff you can't usually afford. Give me 30 days. As an indie filmmaker, you're, you're begging for over 20 yeah, days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, Whereas decades totally, yeah. ago, you, you had like <laughs> 40, 70 days to shoot these amazing Not movies. Not even decades ago. When I was a little kid, you would. Yeah, just time. So not like you just want to spend more time. It's You want to do things without a certain level of duress yeah you know and it's like oh we can only do two takes like we built this entire set like we have 40 people standing around we're spending probably six figures a day and it's like yet we're rushing and we're right. sloppy it's like that's what it gets to be yeah. very surreal like what are we doing this for don't do an impossible schedule to satisfy uh, some arbitrary budget ceiling and hamstring yourself from day one like the, the movie's compromised before you even make it blue ruin succeeded because we had 30 days to shoot it we took time we found locations because who the f wants to go to 82 percent and stop take it all the way you'll spend a little more money but you'll have something to show for it and the, if you if a film is good it will have decades to earn back its money if you have another like piece of that gets dumped to some sea of content, it might make its money back, then it'll be forgotten. I don't want to do that. No, who would want to do that? I do spend a year cobbling together all these locations and getting a little more scope to it. Scope doesn't have to mean huge desert vistas. Scope means it takes place in more than one location. You get a scope by seeing more of the world. Like if you watch episode one of Pops, I very much was doing, most of it was in their apartment. Keep it small. But then in episode two, we were in a bunch more locations and it just felt much more dynamic. Even though we were shooting on the same lousy camera. And not lousy, it was a good SD camera. But, can't. Don't be playing with paper when I'm trying to shoot a vlog about how awesome Jeremy Chalonier is. I can't get to her. She's so tiny. She's wedged herself into this corner. She's going to play with paper through this whole thing. Anyway, five six-day weeks instead of three six-day weeks. This film has a huge scope to it. It takes place over a lot of ground, a lot of different locations. It feels bigger than the money that was spent on it because he took his time. He got a lot of locations that he had access to for free. Took his time to make something visually beautiful and make something good. Cat. 
top? I swear. I've only got so much daylight left here. And that ties into the very next thing I was talking about that scope. He talks about that. For Murder Party, the movie that was before Blue Ruin, it was just uh, a warehouse movie. You know, a bunch of his friends in a warehouse, dialogue, horror, comedy. For Murder Party, the biggest lesson was don't listen to everyone and say, oh, you're doing an indie. An indie movie should be contained in lots of dialogue because it's easier that way. And it gets not for me. I, I again, I gravitate towards the camera, and I want to tell stories visually. So at the end of the day, the movie that he was making, based on the rules, wasn't the movie he actually wanted to make. It was just the movie that the people who are trying to make indie movies were saying is the movie he could make, the movie that was possible to make in today's independent film scene. But he said no. I'm going to take this camera. It's not a RED. He had one of the Canon cameras. It was better than a DSLR. It was a smaller body camera and he had a really nice set of lenses. One of my lessons was don't use the biggest, baddest camera if you don't have the time and the crew to move it fast. I had these amazing cameras on set, but the schedules were so tight that we were doing TV coverage, you know? Single, single, two shot, boom, we're out. We had talked about these amazing, you know, wonders where we were on Dolly Track. And your other movies, yeah. All of our intentions were kind of watered down. I see so many directors that just are forced to make schedules, and they're not even directing. They're just, they're just trying to burn through a schedule, and then you end up with, like, a, I don't even know what. Yep, they didn't have time to set up their big masters or get a bunch of Dolly Track down. All that stuff takes time. To get a camera on a steady cam takes time. To get a camera on a car mount takes a lot of time away from the day. The only t way you can shoot it is over, over, and a wide. And the equipment that you have requires too much to actually get to put it to use. This next one boils down to the simplest bit of advice. I can't afford to do spectacles on the scale of these big movies, but what I can afford to do is show people the stuff in movies that's usually cut out that I find fascinating. The real process is still very merciful to the audience as far as the pacing. That's the thing. you got to make sure that the pacing is right on. The progression of the plot should still happen pretty fast, even if all of your shots are these big, gorgeous dolly shots. He made this with that camera and a five-foot slider. He was able to tell a personal story in an interesting way, a way he hadn't seen before. Again, this is a very small story, scope-wise, in here, but the way he shoots it, the way he puts it together, the way that all of the beats evolve, amazing storytelling, really, really tense cinema. And then this last bit gets into kind of state of the industry kind of stuff. This obviously was not a union movie. This is a super independent movie. This one he finally made as a union movie. And most of that $5 million budget, a little over $5 million budget, went to paying the crew union rates. Jeff Goldsmith asked him that. He's like, you know, you could have put a lot more of that money on the screen if you went non-union crew and took it overseas somewhere. I needed it to finally have a career. Like, I, I have three children, man. <laughs> you know, I got a wife and a, and a mortgage, and I was the breadwinner. And also, I am so tired of owing every single member of the crew a favor. For, for uh, Would you please move the sandbag, please? <laughs> I'd, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Like, uh, could we do just one more take? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You know, it's like you just have this guilt because, right. like, you're paying people and they cannot survive. So, for 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 Green Room, I was like, let's make this union. Let's actually be part of a sustainable community yeah. where we can actually pay each other and be part of you know, these these our, each other's careers. Um, but there was a big cost to that, and so Green Room was shot in the exact same amount of days as Blue Ruin. Um, it had ten times the budget. Ten times the budget in order to pay people what they're worth. That's the deal. And I mean, I've seen that also appearing on the YouTube channel. Like, the good stuff, right? The show that Craig and Matt and Ryan and David and Sam spend their time doing. When they were looking to fundraise their summer season, they made their goal. They had their summer seasons going on right now, but there was plenty of people who wanted to help as much as they could and everything. But there was one comment, there's a couple along the lines of like, why do you need so much money? Super low wages that they were asking for. Because that is a gig. Not like me. I go to work all day and then I come here and I do this stuff. Superpowers on a computer screen and everything. But the comment was basically like, just do it as a hobby. Stop asking people for money. Just do this as a hobby. There's way too much work that goes into it. That's why it takes a year for Pops to come out because it is my hobby. And that's the thing. He needed a career. He couldn't do this anymore. And I was listening to another podcast on uh, Brett Easton Ellis' podcast. I was talking to Sean Baker. Sean Baker is this guy 
who made an award-winning film called Starlet, and then no one was wanted to give him money to make more movies, even though it was a celebrated independent film. And so then he made, this was all the talk of South by Southwest, and it came theatrical, a movie called Tangerine, shot with three iPhones. Liza and I watched it, we liked it a lot. But he's doing the same thing, and here's what he had to say about it. I'm still at that moment where no financiers are there, mm -hmm. and I'm getting worried that once again, because I all I... <laughs> I've wanted to do this for so long. It's just move up into that million dollar range where I can start making films comfortably where it's not this begging and borrowing and living below the poverty line. It's just for everybody included, it's the amazing. cast and crew, where I just want to get past that. That's just the state of things uh, in independent film right now, right, Cutie? Right? That's why I think Jeremy Salonier's advice is very important. Doesn't matter what camera you shoot with, don't try and tell a big story. Try and tell an interesting story and take your time doing it because it's engaging, because it makes you feel something. Like these movies do for me. If you're not spending money especially, you can take your time. That's the pop's way of things. And that hobby thing, maybe making cool stuff is just going to be hobbies from now on. Because the more content there is out there, the less people feel like content is worth paying for. Especially the kinds of money it takes to actually make something worthwhile. Green room. And then maybe it's just going to be hobbyists like me. Maybe I just have to wait everybody else out. Anyway, if you want to see Green Room, it's available, digital download, it's available on Blu-ray and DVD. Go to your local library. My local library had this. I saw that before I went and I bought it at Target, and this is actually my library's copy of Blue Ruin. Green Room. Oh, oh and I totally forgot. I was taking out my best and everything. Um, this is the last day that you can vote for Platoon of Power Squadron as Best Indie Series in this year's Streamy Awards. The indie series with the highest number of votes automatically gets voted into the Streamy nominations. So if you uh, wouldn't mind doing that, it takes like 10 seconds. The link right below the video will take you directly to a link with it all filled out. And then you just got to put your name and your email. And I don't think they email you a whole bunch or anything. And even if they do, it's super easy to unsubscribe. It takes like 10 seconds. Please go do that if you're willing. You guys are awesome. Back to the end of the video. Pops logo. You guys, take it easy.